Hey, everybody. Welcome to a bright and sunny day in Charlotte, North Carolina, week 192. I'm grateful to see the sunshine and Carolina blue skies, man. It's good. So we've got a good program lined up for you. And I think we're going to have to bring back Andrew at some point and do some confessions of an IRS agent. That's always fun. <laughs> but we've got some we've got some things to talk about because there's some pending legislation that could impact you. So you're going to want to pay attention. So if you uh, are new to this, here's the rules. You can harass us on the chat. Hit us up with questions in the q and I'll monitor those. And uh, if there are some trivia things, Jack might have a Starbucks gift card for somebody that answers correctly. But we did get, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think somebody that was new to our, our deal last week said, uh, hey, uh, does everybody get a gift card for, you know, showing up? I'm like, no, <laughs> you, the gift card is us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway oh wow we've already got hey hello how are you there samuel good to see you uh and uh is there any form of incentive uh yes the incentive is that you're going to learn some great things for being on here that's that's the incentive so uh anyway all right so jump ball i know adam has some stuff that he wants to talk about. Jack has some stuff he wants to talk about. And then if you guys have some stuff you want to talk about, that's that's more than dandy. You can go ahead and do that. Uh, just hit us up on the Q&A and we'll talk about it. So, um, oh, and you know what? If you're uh, an accounting professional, you, you, you could be on, <laughs> you, you could get some continuing ed and there are no gift cards for attendees. Yeah, we are the gift. Just, just to re and the hopefully some good knowledge that will save you some money and protect you out there is the gift. Um, so just for anybody that's new to this, we started this almost four years ago. And um it was when we went into lockdown and people were freaking out and then. Along comes the CARES Act and a whole bunch of gobbledygook from the government that nobody could understand. So we decided we're going to try to speak English to what's going on here. That's That was the impetus of this whole thing. And so we've just kept this crazy train running. Um, we did, before we go into anything, so Joe Farrell, who has been with us kind of from the very beginning. Joe, it's good to see you. You'd like to learn about gifting to grandkids outside of trusts sure. so Got you want to hit that before we go into any yeah you've earned, you've, you've earned the right to have that question answered um papa joe so the um you know the night the nice thing about trust as a framework outside of they provide a mechanism to pay for jack's beach house I'm just kidding with that jack yeah honest you know honestly the, from a gifting perspective, the biggest benefit to having a trust is having the ability to parent from the grave. You know, like if, at the end of the day, like, why would I want to put a gift in a trust um, for the benefit of children? It would be so that I can parent them from the grave. And what I mean by parent them from the grave would be things like, you know, hey, Gary, you don't get the money until you turn 25. You know, you get another tranche for graduating from college. You know, if you ever go, if you're ever in rehab, <laughs> then, then you can't, you know, you can't have, you can't have the money, you know, that, that, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, just, you know, for a side note, um, you know, going on the way back machine, Jack, you'll laugh at this. Uh, when I set up my own stuff, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that I was a fan of the original Beverly Hills 90210. And <laughs> when I was asked about parenting from the grave by my estate planning attorney, I said, look, I love that show. And I always wanted to be Dylan McKay, you know, inherit everything at 18. <laughs> so I actually have a letter in my, my kids are over 18 now, but I have a letter in my file from my estate planning attorney saying against my better judgment, <laughs> there are no <laughs> restrictions on, on it. Cause my philosophy was, 
Well, look, A, I'm dead. B, if I didn't do a good job up until that point, you know, I'm not going to do it when I'm dead. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's the reason to have the trust is really to parent from the grave. Um, if, on the other hand, you're not, you know, you don't really care about um, parenting from the grave, therefore you're, you're not, you know, have no interest in a trust or trust administration, um, then... And again, you can have people like Jack be the defect, like the your pseudo parent from the grave, you know, by being your trustee. So the other re the so if, if you if you're not interested in a trust at all, um, then you've got a couple different options which are um, super amazing. Um, option number one is you can you can still just do a normal gift, like a normal documented gift, you know, if it's it's if it's above the threshold. Um, of reporting, which I think is about $14,000 and some change might be a little bit higher than, you know, it's documented against your lifetime gift um, exemption. Um, but it, but it's just a gift. It's their money. You know, that that's the, that's the downside of a gift gift is it's their money. Um, thanks Joe, $18,000 a year. That's right. You should be giving these webinars. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> that that's obviously you know, the easiest thing to do is above $18,000 a document a gift, you know, below $18,000, um, you don't have to document it. You can do it anyway. Um, what's an easy way around this, Jack, this would be the part where you want to close your ears a little bit. Um, but yeah, he's pulling out his earbuds for those who can't see him on camera. But, you know, what I hypothetically could do is to say, Gary, I'm going to loan you a hundred grand. Um, and, uh, gift you $18,000 a year, <laughs> you know, and, and that way I, you know, it's, it's yours and it's also unreportable, but the way that it's unreportable is that I'm gifting you elements of the principal balance, uh, every year to your direct question. Can I set it up an account account and not give it to him? Yeah. I mean, you can set up a joint account. Um, but that's not like, like when you die, it become, it's still part of your estate technically. So you didn't do yourself any favors there. Um, cause it's not a documented, not a documented gift. Um, so that, that's one way the way that, the way that Adam is actually the biggest fan of, um, is to buy, like, in other words, you got, you got some money, you're doing stuff, you're investing in stuff that, that, that Adam's a big fan of buying property that appreciates <laughs> and having it be in someone else's name. So in other, like in that scenario, you know, I go to buy, you know, a commercial building. I don't really care about growing my own net worth, but, you know, I loan Jack, you know, the money to buy in. <laughs> so we're a third, a third, a third, you know, with, with Gary, Jack and, 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 and me. So I, I'm dad, Gary and Jack are my two kids. We're a third, a third, a third, or they're the grandkids, you know. I loan them the money. So, so it's like they didn't put any cash up front. I gift the money back using my $18,000 uh, limit over time. And next thing you know, the building triples in value. You know, they got two thirds of it, you know, from that standpoint. So that, 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 that's really my favorite way um, to, to do gifts. But to your question, like you can put stuff in their name, Joe, but that's not, that doesn't do you anything like that. That's still technically now you may never get caught, but that technically is still in your name and it just happens to be a joint account. So anyway, enough about that. Look at how much time I killed Gary. <laughs> hey, I thought and, that was really interesting. Yeah, and, and I didn't, I didn't actually break any laws. I just skirted a few. <laughs> this is living on YouTube anyway. Just so you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's like keep on noticing that my clients get just kidding. That did not happen. I'm not even gonna say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, Jack, I know that there was something rumbling, or and it's probably still rumbling through the halls of Congress up there on the death tax. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and I I just happened to pull this. I just and so um it kind of flagged up as that there is a potential house in the house, the death tax repeal. Um, the legislation would permanently repeal the so-called death tax, which imposes an unfair and costly tax on the transfer of property land and other assets from a deceased family member to heirs of the family. Um, it says heirs of family farms and small businesses. Uh, it was, it says the bill enjoys significant support 
which was introduced with 167 original con congressional co-sponsors, co-sponsors, and this came from the IFA, which is the International, International Franchise Association. So that's why, you know, when they're talking about when we deal with uh, franchisors and franchisees about succession planning, so it kind of weaves well into what um, Adam was just talking about. So uh, they need to build coalition and and take it outside of the committee and into the full house and into the Senate for that. Um, wanted to mention also kind of what's going on with the Fed and about rates not moving at all, meaning moving down. And so a couple of uh, snippets from a publication from the Federal Reserve directly yesterday afternoon. So um, it says the Federal Reserve sent a tepid signal that it is done raising interest rates, but made it clear that it is not ready to start cutting. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range um, until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving substantially toward a toward two percent, um, and they don't think that that will happen in March either. So they're thinking maybe it's uh, you know into second quarter of the year that 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 they may that may or may not happen. So um, that's what's going on with with that. I heard on the radio this morning that um, some people were anticipating seven reductions uh, in various increments over the course of the year and feel like that that maybe is not going to happen simply because that would mean likely that they would have done something this month. And now they're saying maybe not even next month, then, you know, but if the range is larger, then it really doesn't matter if it's seven or two, if the number's higher, if it's more than a, you know, if it's a half percent versus a quarter percent, whatever the reduction is. So, um, and then unless there's something else either of you wants to talk about, I'll go into kind of what happened or the hist quick history of the bipartisan tax bill. Uh, there's a focus on the child tax credit, but um, I'll let Adam go into the details. I think there's maybe six or seven parts to it, uh, including aid to um, or affordable housing and then uh, aid to Taiwan and some other stuff, but obviously the core stuff is what impacts the, your, your businesses. So here's here's the the Cliff Notes version of the um, the description uh, for this bipartisan tax bill that the House passed. Yeah, and by 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 bipartisan, what I did want to get into um, before you hop into it, I mean, like you know, we we've, we've kind of railed on um, the Mickey Mouse clown show uh, quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> uh here while still trying to stay uh somewhat libertarian or i mean apolitical um but i mean seriously this this pat like this wasn't like fake bipartisan support <laughs> you know this was like 300 and something to like 70 something i mean it, it was like real deal serious you wow know, all the you only people only people that only people that protested only people that did not vote for it were like, you know, for good for for you know some kind of legitimate reasons on the um, state and local tax deduction side that I would tend to agree with. You know, they they just did a protest vote, and on the other side of that that was a Republican side. On the other side, you know, it was more around oh we need to do more for working families and kids and stuff like that. So it's like this was I mean that's that's a lot like in the, in today's environment. To get that much overwhelming support, um, that's awesome. And in the Senate, you know, there are already some, oh, what should we do? Including from our Senator, Tom Tillis, who I will, you know, never mind, I won't say that because I'll probably have Secret Service at my house. Um, but like, <laughs> seriously, this would be ridiculous if this did not pass with this kind of support through the House. Yeah, and you you got the number pretty close. Good memory. It's It was 357 to 70. Yeah, it's so freaking shocking that it got burned in my brain, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, when I when I saw that, I was surprised. And actually, like, um yeah. That, that's why we call it like post office naming by parts and support. <laughs> yeah, and, and even you know, on, on the smaller version of it. So when it was going through um the House Ways and Means Committee. It passed with bipartisan support out of that committee on January 19th by a vote of 40 to 3. So then you have an exponential or multiple 
kind of uh, of that as you see in the in the house so yeah it was 357 to 70 um it's going to go to the senate uh and then the the quote is its fate is uncertain so um wednesday night passed the bill uh, the headline is it would enhance the popular child tax credit to benefit millions of american families um and there's more to it than that but uh, quotes, other quotes, this bottom-up process is a good example of how Congress is supposed to make law. Um, several New York Republicans were angered that the tax bill did not have state and local tax deduction limits, as, as Adam said, salt provisions. Uh, apparently, this was a top priority uh, for the lawmakers in New York. Uh, and there's you know further discussion about maybe how that might be addressed differently, not to, to say it's not important, but to... Um, you know, try to move it on. And then um, others, including conservatives, criticized the bill for expanding the child tax credit, but not many. Many liberal Democrats voted against the bill because they argue the bill does not expand the child tax credit enough. But um, so that's kind of the landscape of the voting and kind of people's perspectives of that. And so if you want to kind of jump into the more of the details of what those provisions are and um, how they work and what the proposal is. And again, remember how it works is it passes the house, it goes to the Senate, um, you know, and then the, you know, remember, um, what was it, how a, a bill becomes a law, the schoolhouse rock, you know, so I, when I think about these things, that's what I think about in my head, the little bill that's wrapped up sideways and has, you know, is, is a little cartoon figure. Yeah. So, now, now that I have You're dating yourself, messed up with your heads, then yeah. Those were really good. <laughs> they were. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, did you want to kind of start diving into um, cool stuff and then we'll, um, you know, we'll maybe go into questions that people have about it? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Awesome. Um, so cool item number uh, one Actually, I'll go. I'll go. To, I'll go. To, I'll go to. I'll go to what I believe is the cool item number one. Cool item number one is how we're going to pay for it, <laughs> um, and how we're going to pay for it is that they're basically going to shut off any future um, employee retention tax credit claims. So, in other words, like, it, so I think that the working theory is that if you've already got an application for an employee retention tax credit refund in process currently, because as people may know, the IRS put a hold on processing any refund claims um, several months back just to kind of work through um, any cases of fraud. So what they would do in theory is to say any applications received after January 31st um, or some date in the future, like we're not, we're not doing anything with those, but anything that was in before then, you know, we'll go ahead and process through the system um, what the what the claims were. So that that's cool. You know, like I, you know, yay, I'm for that. You know, like, <laughs> that seems seems like a good idea because if you had submitted a claim at this point, what rock were you? Either you are committing fraud or you've been under a rock. <laughs> you know, so that that's pretty cool. But first item number one um, that impacts the majority of our clients is that. Um, you know, under the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, you know, they they extended some really cool depreciation rules whereby, you know, basically this gets confusing to people because there's bonus depreciation and there's Section 179, which is two different things that result in the same answer. It's just when you got bonus depreciation, if I made 100 bucks and I bought 500 grand in equipment, I could still depreciate all of it and take the loss in the current year. So I would create a $450,000 loss I get it in the current year. So if I know the sources of income, I can offset it. Section 179, same set of facts. I can still fully expense the 500 grand in equipment. However, I don't get the benefit of using the $450,000 loss in the current year. It has to wait until I make future income in that business. So in a lot of cases, you know, we'll, we'll use actually both tools. But point being is that that depreciation had been lowering so it was at 80 percent in 2023 it was set to be at, at um 60 percent in 2024 so they would actually um make it 100 percent for 2023 
Um, so instead of 80%, it'd be at 100% for 2023, which is pretty cool. You know, like a lot of people buy stuff weren't counting on 100%, they get 100%. Um, so that that's awesome. They also raised the section 179 limitation by um, some, like, I don't know if that's going to materially affect people or not, but they're going to raise the section 179 limitation um, by some. So those are, those are two pretty exciting um, items because that, you know, I don't know if that really changed uh, people's decision-making in terms of whether or not they're going to buy a business or asset or not, but it certainly makes it easier, you know, from a financing standpoint, when you get even more accelerated tax benefit uh, up front. Yeah, that's a big one. Cool. Um, so the I'm glad you clarified that because when I first saw that, I was like, bonus depreciation. Now we have to start depreciating bonuses that we get. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. So the other one that's pretty cool as well is that, um, you know, we have one of the most overlooked tax credits that is out there is the research and development credit. Um, so basically, you know, you do stuff that qualifies as research, which, you know, all sorts of items can qualify as research, um, whether it's process improvement, you know, actual product development, you know, in the classic sense, software development. I mean, there's lots of stuff that can qualify. Well, you got, you know, you get a credit on the labor for doing that stuff. Um, and what they did, which was crappy is that it used to be you could not only deduct Gary's salary, <laughs> but get a credit for it too. <laughs> so it was like, sweet, I get a fully <laughs> expense Gary's salary and you're gonna give me money? Where do I sign up for that? <laughs> um, so it's a fabulous, you know, benefit, you know, especially if you weren't making a ton of money, you know, there, there in the beginning. Um, but so then what they did is they said, oh, nay, nay, Instead of me getting to, I'll still give you the credit, but instead of getting to expense Gary's labor, I now have to capitalize it and amortize it over kind of whatever period is associated with the property, which would be typically five years. So I got to pay Gary a hundred grand in exchange for paying Gary a hundred grand, I get about a $13,000 tax credit. Woohoo. But I lost a hundred thousand dollar tax deduction <laughs> and in exchange for it, I got a $20,000 deduction in the current year. So like I'm upside down, <laughs> you know, you know, in that, in that, in that, in that scenario. So it, uh, it just was not good. Now, granted, I was going to get to expense Gary's hundred grand that I paid him in the future, but whoopee. I mean, most people when given the opportunity, it's like Wembley. It's like, you know, I would gladly take a cheeseburger today instead of taking two cheeseburgers tomorrow. Like even though over the five years I was in the money, um, you know, it sucks when you're paying, to, paying more in tax than you're getting back in a credit for the right to have the credit in the future deduction. So it, it sucked um, the way that they're doing it. And then, then to make matters even worse, Jack, <laughs> um, they didn't make it freaking optional, you know, like, could I, you know, what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to say, oh, well, your policy sucks. Therefore, can we just say I didn't have any research? <laughs> you know, they're like, no, if you had research, you need to capitalize. it. So th there was, this was a big protest area um, for people to try to get fixed. So they fixed it to where it's going back to the way that we like the rules, which is I not only get to deduct Gary's salary, um, I get a tax credit uh, for it. And what's even better about it is that, you know, apologies to the clients that we had to screw and tr totally try to make it work for them in 2023, but I get to go back and fix it, you know, for, for prior years by doing a catch up um, of whatever I had to amortize in the past. So that's, that's that's another good one. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, Jack, I figured I'd pass it over to you to talk about um, the tax treaty benefits for residents of Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 
Uh, okay, stall, stall, stall. It's a bad, bad dream. He wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> I, was I, I have it. I can tell you if you're really interested, but okay. let's, <laughs> let's skip over that one. If we have time oh. at the end and people still on, then maybe, you know, yeah, we can, yeah. We can oh, give away oh, gift oh. cards. Yeah. <laughs> Hold That's on. Right. This one came in from Derek. Derek, it's good to see you on here. He's been a faithful guy on here too. Uh, this morning's update from FedWatch for a few uh, future meeting dates. Current Fed funds target range is 525 bips to 550. Uh, March 20 meeting, 55% same, 45% 25 bit reduction. Uh, July 31st meeting, 44% 75 bit uh 44 percent 100 percent and nine percent 125 bit uh reduction so um and then december 9th or 18 meeting so this 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 seems like uh, las vegas <laughs> you know like what are you going to put your money on <laughs> um 20 125 bit 41 percent 150 percent or 150 bit and 29 percent 175 bit interesting very interesting who knows right i mean who knows i'd be curious derek as a banker how's that impacting decisions today and what's what's you know what's happening in flow you can hit us in the chat if you want to that'd be i'd be curious to see and hear more about that but while he's doing that let's go to taiwan with jack no, i'm just kidding <laughs> what's the next one adam um the next one that sorry what did i just hear something there um next no, one you know, yeah not not that big of a deal um yeah a little bit nice since we're just in the middle of 1099 um hell at bgw is they're raising the reporting requirement from 600 bucks to a thousand bucks um, so yay on that. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, in terms of what would be um, really relevant for our client base, you know, a little bit is they, uh, they're changing the refundable portion of the child tax credit from 1600 bucks to 1800 bucks. And then it increases all the way up to 2000 bucks. Um you know, which is good. I mean, that that's 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 more for the low income um, people, as because you know they're 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 making they're trying to make a case that, um, you know, that child tax credit has done a lot to help out um, people that are below the the poverty limit uh, that have kids. Um, so they're they're bumping up the refundable portion of it, and then you know, there's also some talk about getting that money in people's hands. Um, before they actually file their tax returns. You know, some people are saying, well, that's an election stunt, you know, just so that people can get a check um, right before uh, the election from, you know, President Joe Biden. I, you know, I don't know one way or the other on that. I don't know if you remember Gary or not, but uh, you remember the check you got courtesy of George W. Bush? Like, you, did you get no. one of those too, Jack? Okay, you didn't have, like, well, your kids, you you did. I mean, your George kids. George W. Bush? I don't yeah, remember. Your, your, your kids were around. Yeah, right when he came in office, he passed a uh, a uh, tax, a, a, a ta some tax reform that included, um, is it the child tax credit or actually a rate reduction? He sent everybody a check. <laughs> it said, it said right in the middle of the line, courtesy of President Bush. <laughs> I miss I miss that. So it's reason. not that it, it's not that it's unprecedented, but he just <laughs> waited. He just waited until uh, he was actually elected to do it versus right before an election. <laughs> yeah, three hundred bucks, according to Joseph. <laughs> per kid, per kid. I mean, I remember it being enough that I was like, yeah, it's you know, like I'm actually going to deposit it. <laughs> I think I kept mine or a copy of it just because people would not believe me decades down the road that that actually happened in American history. So yes, yeah, I I, yeah. I don't, I didn't, I don't know if it actually had happened before then, and it probably cost more to print and mail the freaking checks than we actually got. <laughs> we actually got, but that, yeah, that that's what the proposal would be: is that hey, there'd be some element of this that they would actually give the money to the people 
um, before having to file the returns. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I still remember the one from President Trump, but it didn't say from President Trump. It was during COVID. And so I did buy an exercise bike that I still use. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. Well, that that's it, Gary. That's <laughs> we it. Can, we can either go early <laughs> or, keep, or keep talking about okay. something else. But I'll throw got, two you in. Got, you got tax reform, man, in terms of like the, the highlights. And and when are we thinking? Like I heard with with the repeal or not, it, not the repeal but the shutting of the gate of ERC right mm -hmm. we were hearing rumors that that could happen as early as Wednesday right and it didn't i guess yet but we've got one guy that we've been talking to his CPA was poo-pooing ERC ERC poo-pooing forever and he absolutely qualifies. He absolutely qualifies. I'm like, holy moly. So we're trying to do some heroics to get that through. So any idea like when this is actually going to happen, Jack, you know, with your uh, great Karnak skills of, you know, <laughs> any thoughts? Yeah, it's hard to determine because it's, it's, um, the federal government seems to be able to or have a desire to shuffle money from one bucket to another. And then they say, OK, well, we're we're stopping this or we're stopping this program. But then yet there's still money in there. So it seems kind of arbitrary and maybe, kind of, you know, nothing's arbitrary with the federal government or with the with any government. But, you know, it's is it designed to create an excess surplus to put somewhere else? to be used for something else or was it already promised in in another program so yeah i mean i i had heard the same things but i also heard that previously you know pre previous to now that it would happen and then some said well you know they might pull money from other places there's also in relatedly um because they are still pursuing those or processing those claims so as part of the bill that we were talking about today says, um, under current law, a $1,000 penalty may apply to a person who knows or has reason to know that an understatement of the tax liability would re um, uh, result from the use of aid, assistance, or advice. And this relates back to ERTC. So they've increased the, well, basically what I'm saying is that they've increased the penalties for ERTC um, fraud, which means that they are not quite done with that. And in the money they get back or collect back or are able to retrieve, you know, what are they going to do with that money? But at some point you do have to say, we got to stop and move on to the next thing because it's just not efficient to process. Um, another thing that came up in this kind of miscellaneous is that there was an increase in the, increase in the threshold for information reporting on forms 1099 NEC and MISC miscellaneous. So, um, it's generally it was generally six hundred dollars. Uh, it increases the threshold to a thousand dollars and adjusts it for inflation after twenty twenty four. Um, new threshold is based on payments during the calendar year and it applies to payments made after December thirty first, twenty twenty three, meaning just for twenty twenty four. Now, I remember the days where, and even with my kids that didn't make six hundred dollars or maybe did. I mean, it's been six hundred dollars for a while because I remember when I was younger. And I was refereeing NCAA soccer games and high school soccer games, and they would pay you cash or a check uh, made out to you. And you know, I made not much more over, but over six hundred dollars. Um, you know, see, let's let's say hypothetical. Let's say there's a hypothetical NCAA I'm soccer a confession, referee confession that, of <laughs> that maybe didn't report all of that income that may have exceeded that limit. You know, when it's that amount, you really, most people are like, yeah, whatever, it, whether it's babysitting gigs and things like that, that you're supposed to report. Well, that doesn't get reported. So I'm not encouraging bad behavior. I'm just saying it happens. That's, you know, stuff happens. So that's in there. Um, child credit, you know, we didn't talk about that a whole lot, but just kind of, you know, for your own personal benefit, obviously not related to your businesses, but maybe related to your employees that, um, you know, it may make a difference in their overall income and how they, they you know, uh, deal with their own finances. So 
Um, refundable credit on a per child basis under current law, the maximum refundable child credit is computed by multiplying that tax taxpayer's earned income in excess of $2,500 by 15%. Um, so the provision modifies the calculation that the maximum refundable credit, you first multiply the income in excess of 2,500 by 15, 15% and then multiply that amount by the number of qualifying children. Um, so, and I don't know this for sure, but it sounds like that it was just 15%, but it was regardless of the number of children. I don't know. Does that make sense? I just read that for the first time. I don't know if that, anyway, um, that's what it sounds like. And then multiply that amount by the number of qualifying children. So um, effective for 23, 24, and 25. Uh, modification to overall limit and child tax credit. Uh, adjustment for inflation and rules for determination of what actually earned income is. So all those things that um, I am way out of my lane in now and forever. Um, go talk to your CPA about. There you go. <laughs> you did great. And and if uh, and if you guys weren't on the two webinars that we did on the Corporate Transparency Act, here's the Cliff's notes. Yeah, the penalties are real. They're no joke. You have to register if you have an LLC, even if it's a single member LLC, and don't talk to your attorney. Uh, accountant, talk to your business attorney. That's the Cliff's notes from two hours of. <laughs> so, the, uh, so Derek Painter, thank you for um, chiming in on this. So, Derek's with US Bank. Uh, he said, We started to see loan requests coming back anemic in 2023 as long term rates have already started coming down, which means we have an inverted yield curve, which Historically, a possible indication of a downturn ahead. I've actually seen some of that again, too, uh, in some of the commentary I've been watching and reading. But uh, but it's been that way for months. A millennial assessment, I heard, isn't bad. Good economy, bad vibes. The reality is higher rates are the new normal and new norm, uh, the old normal and new normal. Loan demand isn't fully back, but better than nothing, which was what we effectively had in the second half of 2023. Companies are generally remaining conservative and carrying more liquidity than they did during or pre-COVID. And with interest rates being up, we're seeing ex excess cash going into money markets and investment sweeps, which we haven't seen since 2009. Uh, so yeah, that's good. Uh, so Derek, thanks for that. That's good commentary. Also, just as a, a little precursor on February the 22nd, remember when we had, um, Kevin Monahan on, and this was a couple weeks ago and we were talking about why incentives can actually backfire and what are some good things that you can do that actually work on retention behind the, you know, the good intentions that are behind that. So um, there was just a lot of kind of demand, a lot of great questions on that. So we're going to have him back on the 22nd of February. So you might want to mark that up down on your calendar. So the 22nd, we'll have Kevin Monahan back on here and uh, that'll be really good because it was, and if you haven't watched it, go back a couple weeks and you, you can uh, listen to that because it was good. Anything else from the gallery? Thank you, Derek, for that was pretty good dissertation. Um, back to Corporate Transparency Act. Okay, here we go. As an S Corp with less than 50 employees, do I need to complete this? There is no um, number of employee safe zone. It is you are in existence or you come into an existence. And if you're a business, and this is a very general, but um, then you have to report. And so, and, and there are certain exemptions on types of entities, but you know, general for-profit businesses. Now, having said that, there is stuff in the works uh, and including some uh, on the legislative side of things, some um, 
political action committees and others that are uh, you know, lobbying for a change in that. Uh, as we discussed, I think maybe last week, one of those changes is kind of kicking the can down the road even further than it already is um, for most businesses. Well, for businesses that were formed prior to January 1st of this year, you have until the end of this year, essentially, to file that. If you're formed this year, you have 90 days from the date of formation to file this information. And then in all cases, if things change, you have 30 days to make those changes once you have filed the initial filing. And so what ends up, what may end up happening is similar to how the chaos of PPP came about and, P and, and asking for um, forgiveness of that. And then, okay, are they going to chase after you? What forms do you have to fill out? And then kind of, you know, if you may remember to way back when that they created this, you know, PPP forgiveness EZ form. It's like a 1040 EZ that, okay, if you're under a certain amount of, of on the loan, I think it may, may have been a hundred thousand dollars. It's been so long ago. I don't remember, but then, you know, it's, is a, I hear doggies. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought that was me for a second. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, dogs in the office on the 22nd floor of my building. Um, all right. So, um, but, but I think what will happen is, is if the, if the white house changes hands, then you will see either a reversal of this or tenuation of it, similar to what we saw with PPP, which is for certain businesses, whether it's based on revenue, whether it's based on employee count. And you know, then you're going to have to go into what are you know full-time equivalents and all those things that come together. So I, I expect that, well, if again, if the White House changes, that there would be changes. I think if the White House does not change hands as far as political party, then that will stay there and it may actually increase as far as what the requirements are. So again, I that's you know not a political statement. It is just kind of what people are saying on either side of it already. Yeah, and what to to go back to? Hey, if I'm below fifty employees, you know, can I be exempt? It, you know, it's actually way worse. I mean, as Jack talked about, you know, there's not, you know, there are some exemptions. But what's ironic about this is it, it it's it's like it's targeted to small businesses because exemption number one is more than five million in sales. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, by default, it's like, well, if you have less than fifty employees you probably are going to have to report, you know, versus like, if I have more than 50, I'm probably not going to have to report. I mean, presumably, you know, they, that's because, you know, somebody, you know, air quote, smarter than us, Jack figured that, you know, if I'm a big boy business, I'm probably not committing fraud and big boy business is greater than 5 million in revenue for, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they, they think that would be the case. So it, again, it's ridiculous. Now here's a, Gary, it, Gary Ford to me, one of your peers. Um, I, I wouldn't have figured this coming out of him, but uh, Matt, Matt, Matt Joiner, Matt Joiner <laughs> had, had this freaking tie. Like, good for you, Matt, but had a freaking tirade on the constitutionality. <laughs> this it's like you go, sir. <laughs> yeah, we have a we have our business law annual meeting for the bar association next week, and I usually that's I get to see him typically once a year or so, even though, you know, we're not too far away each other in the scheme of things in Charlotte. Um, but yes, that was, thank you for sharing that with me. That was, that was yeah, fun welcome. to watch or fun to read. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and, and the other aspect of that, that, you know, I hadn't really thought about is that, okay, how difficult is this? Because if you've sought a business loan, or any banking relationship, you have that, you know, know your customer thing that, that everyone has to fill out, which provides a lot of this information already. So the, the, the argument was that business owners are already used to providing this information. So um, to a bank, so why is this such a big deal? Um, well, you know, for, um, for those who do not choose to reveal information to bankers or others, it's a it's a privacy issue is what it comes down to, and you're basically trying to find uh, needles 
in the haystack of bad actors by getting everyone's information and then creating a pathway to, you know, um, for, for law enforcement. I mean, it, it has its legitimacy and good reasons, but it's, it, as you said, it's not targeting the people that um, either are likely to do the really bad things or have the means to do really bad things, essentially. You know, um, if you're running a business and, and um, you know, you create, you're conducting criminal activity, um, you know, but you, know, you don't have the means to do it. really tell me <laughs> anything yeah. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, a, it, it's, it's a database of LinkedIn essentially is what it comes yeah. down to. It's, it makes it easier to see the links between businesses and owners and say, Oh, Hey, look, that guy, Adam in Charlotte. Oh, interestingly, he owns his business in Belize. He owns business, you know, in other places. And hmm, yeah, we had this issue down in, or, you know, owns a business down in Columbia and, you know, gosh, drug cartel stuff. And, you know, now all of a sudden you're roped into something. You're like, what the heck just happened? So, yeah. Yeah. Nothing like taking a chainsaw to a situation that requires a scalpel. Especially when I own a legitimate import export business. <laughs> that was very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to send you like several Starbucks cards for that. <laughs> there you go. That was. There you go. Yeah. I think the host should get a, a Starbucks card <laughs> for doing this. Uh, hey, and also our 200th week anniversary is coming up in eight weeks. So we're going to try to do something for that. Something special. So we'll see what that is but we've got to we got to plan it <laughs> so anyway any other last minute questions comments from the gallery before we call it a day i'll i'll give you three more seconds <laughs> all right well we're going to go ahead and call it a day we will put this up on the bgwcpa youtube channel later on this afternoon and Jack Santanello and the Shoemaker crew, they've got their own YouTube channel as well. So you can go there too. I'm I'm not sure which one is going to be better though. Like seriously, it's the same one. So <laughs> go, go either way. Thank you guys for being here. We appreciate the questions, appreciate the comments and interaction, and we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Take care now. Thank you.